الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسيما كثيرا أما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way Allah deserves to be praised and we ask Allah to exalt the mansion and grant peace and send his blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam This is the second episode and the most interesting because it has taken into consideration all of the comments which I find to be surprising uh, where people are paying attention to uh, t-shirts versus taubes, uh, length of the beard, style of the beard, bald head, yani, mashallah, tabarakallah, uh, everything um, except uh, what I intend. Now I know you guys have good intentions and that's why I've taken the steps towards uh, making everybody satisfied. I hope and pray that there will be less distractions right now and we can focus on the actual subject matter, which I know you've been focusing on, but still, any other distraction should be eliminated and that is my objective, eliminate distraction. Why do we have to eliminate distraction? Because we have already established that in the Muslim household, the most important relationship that you have ever is the one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the foundation upon everything is built. In fact, our relationship with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a byproduct of our relationship with Allah. Meaning, had Allah not selected the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be the messenger, his messenger to us, then we wouldn't know him. And we, he wouldn't be someone, of course he would be uh, loved for his uh, character that everybody loved and appreciated, but he wouldn't be someone that we are uh, asked to obey, like we are asked to obey now, but because Allah Azza wa Jal selected him, therefore we have this veneration. And of course, Allah Azza wa Jal has the best selection and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the best person to be selected for this mission. And therefore, under that concept of our relationship with Allah, our obedience to Allah, comes at the same level our obedience to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is something that I want to elaborate on uh, somewhat because we, we know a lot of people have some serious confusion about this issue. A serious confusion about this issue. They believe that we believe in the Quran and then the Sunnah. Where the Quran and the Sunnah, in terms of authority, they have the same authority. Because whatever the Messenger وسلم, said is what Allah Azza wa Jal, Azza wa Jal revealed to him. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَى He does not speak of his own desire, it is nothing more but a revelation revealed unto him. And so we Muslims believe in the Quran and the Sunnah. The only difference between them is that makes it infallible and there's no room for mistakes. There's no room for a, a weak narration in the Quran. Whereas in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah Azza wa Jal decreed with his wisdom that there will be a layer of verification that is required, which Allah Azza wa Jal also established. And he dedicated, he made sure that there are dedicated men who spend their entire lives studying, communicating, understanding the chain of narrators and the narrations and preserving the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just like the Quran was preserved. Because if you don't accept the sunnah or if you want to make the sunnah a level below the Quran, then you don't really have Islam anymore. You don't have Islam anymore. You don't know how to pray five times a day from the Quran. The Quran does not tell you that Salah begins with, uh, you know, first you have to have uh, the niyyah and then, you know, the shurut al-salah, then takbirat al-ihram, then uh, dua al-istiftah, then uh, surat al-fatiha, then ma tayassara min al-Quran, you recite whatever you know of the Quran, then you say Allahu Akbar, you go to ruku, I'm not going to describe the whole Salah, but you get my point, you get the gist of the matter. And the same can be said about Hajj, and the same thing can be said about Zakah, and so many aspects of the religion cannot be understood, cannot be fulfilled. The religion will be incomplete if it weren't for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So his status 
is so great. So great within the boundaries that Allah revealed. You see, humans love extremism. If they don't neglect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if they don't neglect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they wind up, they wind up going to extreme in honoring him and loving him and venerating him and so on and so forth. And that is a problem because you have to be on the middle course. We have people that believe that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is uh, Hadir Nadir. He is uh, present and observant. And that the Messenger of Allah hears their dua. And the Messenger of Allah intercedes for them with Allah. And the Messenger of Allah uh, removes the karb. And, and they do istighatha with him. They seek his aid and assistance besides Allah. And the list goes on and on and on about deviations and, ex and, and innovations and extremism in one's love of the Prophet ﷺ, poetry written about him, given him the qualities of Allah, even qualities greater than those of Allah. Making Allah at a, at a level lesser than the Messenger of Allah. All of these are extremes. If you want to have a proper Muslim household, then you have to understand the role of the Prophet ﷺ, just like the Sahaba understood the role of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. You can't go extra, you can't fall short. You can't go extra and you cannot fall short. That's what Allah says in the beginning of Surah Al-Hujurat. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la tuqaddimu bayna yaday illahi wa rasoolih wa attaqu allaha inna allaha sami'un alim. Oh, you have believed, do not put yourself forward before Allah and His Messenger. And fear Allah, verily Allah is all hearing, all knowing. Don't present yourself, don't put anyone's statement before that of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have many, many evidences about that. Many evidences about that, that we need to be very mindful of so we can understand the relationship with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if someone asked, what are the etiquettes and the manners that are incumbent on me to maintain with the Messenger of Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Well, before I delve into those, I would like first to remind you that when you hear his name, you should say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You should say Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, whichever format you follow. But that expression of sending Salat and Salam upon the Nabi is one of his rights Alaihi Wasallam. And the miserly one is the one who hears it and does not send Salat and Salam. So a lot of people are uh, negligent and uh, oblivious to this. They hear the name of the Messenger of Allah so many times and not even once do they say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So please, you owe it to yourself to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whenever he's mentioned. Number two, you should read a book which describes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam physically and in terms of his character so you can know who he is. If you truly love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we will discuss what is expected of you in terms of love, you should know his traits Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, both physical and uh, mental. Yani his, his state, his behavior, his behavior, and his physical appearance. And a lot of Muslims have no idea what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to look like. They don't know what he used to look like. Of course, parts of his, uh, part of his appearance has to do with acts of worship that are, are obligatory on us, and others that are recommended, and others that are, as the ulama call them, as sunnah tabi'iyah, the natural sunnah, which is something that was common back then, and you know, you really don't get rewarded for following it, and you don't get sinful, you're not sinful for not following it. And some of the scholars say, but if you follow it, inshallah, it means for you to get more reward. So that's the first thing. Know who the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is. Once you have known who he is, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, know that we have to obey him completely. Allah says in the Quran, مَن يُطِعِ الرَّسُولِ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ الله. Surah Al-Nisa, Ayah 80. Please, please, focus. This needs a sip. Whosoever obeys the messenger has therefore obeyed Allah. You cannot get any clearer than this. And that ayah is a refutation against all the Quranites or those people who say that we believe in the Quran only. 
if you believe in the Quran only, then this ayah makes no sense. Because if you believe in the Quran only, then you are obeying Allah already. Already you are doing the obedience of Allah. So where is the obedience of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa How does that exemplify? Unless you claim that the Quran is the speech of the Messenger of Allah, which you cannot do, that you leave Islam. So if you believe that the Quran is the speech of Allah, you have and you followed the Quran, you've obeyed Allah. So how do you obey the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Subhanallah. That's why knowledge is key. When you know certain ayat in the Quran and someone tries to pre present to you a doubt that confuses you, you know exactly how to address it. That's why the methodology of our righteous predecessors is the most valuable asset that you have after being a Muslim. Because we have all types of Muslims. May Allah bless them all. But if you truly want to be saved, then the ultimate salvation is in understanding the Quran and the Sunnah as understood by the earlier righteous generations. And when you have that understanding, then you are on the path that leads to paradise and the ultimate sense. Therefore, one way to paradise. طيب. Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ قُلْ أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولِ فَإِن تَوَلَّوْا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْكَافِرِينَ Surah Al Imran, Ayah 31 and 32, Ayah 31 and 32. Again, another straightforward, unambiguous, clear-cut definition of the expectation regarding the Messenger of Allah. Say, if you claim that you love Allah, then follow me, Allah will love you. As the scholars say, some of the people claim that they love Allah, and so Allah challenged them with this ayah. And the irony in this ayah is, it sets out to prove that you love Allah. You're supposed to get the result of proving that you love Allah, but the outcome of obeying the Messenger of Allah is that Allah Azza wa Jal will love you. And if Allah loves you, then what's your problem, Senor? Or Senorita? Or Senora? Or whatever you are. What's your problem in this world if Allah loves you? None. Zero. Double zero. If Allah loves you, hey, hey, you're saved. If Allah loves you, it's over. If Allah loves you, you're, you're going to make it. If Allah loves you, you will be in paradise eternally, eternally, forever and ever and ever. It will never end. You thought there was a problem with the mic? There isn't. If, you, if Allah loves you, khalas, khalas, brothers and sisters, it's a wrap. It's a done deal. How do you attain Allah's love? Obey and follow the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now you say this to the Muslims today. Look at the Sunnah and the lives of the Muslim. You will find it rarely, barely there. There you go. Just came up with an expression. You will find it rarely, barely there. It's there amongst a few in certain areas. But it's definitely not the way it's supposed to be. And therefore, we lack the love of Allah. And when we lack the love of Allah, the Ummah suffers. Always connect the dots. Things will make a lot of sense to you. The continuation of the ayah, not only will Allah love you, but Allah will also forgive you your sins. And Allah is the most forgiving and the most merciful. Say, obey Allah and His Messenger. But if they turn away, then verily Allah does not love the disbelievers. Disbelievers. Allah does not love the disbelievers. Those who don't obey Allah and His Messenger. So you have to understand that obeying the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the most important thing after obeying Allah. In fact, obeying Allah means obeying the Messenger of Allah. And obeying the Messenger of Allah means obeying Allah because they go hand in hand because Allah Azza wa Jal said, Rasul faqad ata Allah. Of course, of course, don't panic. We are speaking about the matters of the Sunnah that are obligatory because I'm sure you're educated enough to understand that when we say the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it does not mean everything that he said is obligatory. We are speaking about the aspects of the Sunnah that are not from the Quran, they're from the Hadith, yet they are obligatory. Those are the ones that we have to obey. Those are the ones that we have to obey. If there's a difference of opinion among the scholars, then that's to be discussed at that time. The things that are clear cut, black and white, unambiguous, straightforward, then those are not negotiable. 
And be careful of people trying to make things that are not negotiable, negotiable. That really has to do with how sensitive you are to the topics and how careful you are in being in the right uh, area and avoiding the doubt. We ask Allah Azza wa to aid us in doing so. So first, obedience to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Second, tasdiquhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bima akhbar min umuri al-ghaybi al-madiya wal-mustaqbaliya. Believing in everything that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, be it of the past or the future. Meaning there are things he told us about the nations that preceded us. You know, كَانَ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ رَجُلِ For example, Rasulullah said in the hadith, among the Bani Israel was a man who did such and such. Anything he told us about the previous nations, we believe. And anything he told us about the future, we also believe. So it's complete belief in everything that the Prophet ﷺ said. And Allah Azza wa Jal, the evidence for that is Surah Al-Najm as we quoted in the beginning. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُحَىٰ Why do you have to believe? Because the Prophet ﷺ doesn't speak of his own desire. Whatever Allah decreed will be preserved and conveyed to us is what Allah wanted to be conveyed to us is therefore a re revelation from Allah. Is therefore a revelation from Allah. And when the Prophet ﷺ would make a decision and that decision would not, would not be the best, it's, it's excellent, but it's not the ultimate best, Allah Azza wa Jal will reveal the rectification right away, such as Surah Abasa wa Tawalla, or the story of Abasa wa Tawalla. So that no one can come and say there were things that were left unattended. If the Prophet ﷺ could have done something better, Allah revealed unto him how to do it better, and it was conveyed to us. Therefore, by the time he passed away and returned to his Lord وسلم, we had everything that we needed to know from him, so that we believe everything he said about the past, and everything that he said about the future. And so be careful of those who doubt the Messenger of Allah. Or I would like to make a special notice to those who try to analyze and make his statements verifiable depending on whether science approves it or not. Meaning you tell certain Muslims, the Prophet ﷺ said, for example, about when the fly enters into someone's uh, uh, food or drink, that in one, one wing there's the, the bacteria, and then the other one there's the antibacteria, there's the, the illness and the uh, cure are both within the fly. If someone, and we have an authentic hadith from the Prophet ﷺ about that, and someone wants to verify whether he will accept this hadith or not, depending on whether science proves it or not, that is actually an act of disbelief in the Messenger of Allah. And I will tell you, Wallahi, thumma wallahi, thumma wallahi, thumma wallahi. If they brought all the doctors in the world and all the laboratories and they made all their studies to prove that this is not the case, but the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, and we have an authentic tradition, Wallahi, we will believe him and disbelieve in all of them. And that is Iman. Because he receives from the creator of the scientists and these scientists are, for the most part, insane people. Scientists have not agreed on, Ya Sheikh, every 15 minutes they change their minds. The earth has gone from being flat to being round to being flat. And then, you know, the, the origin of the human beings are from uh, uh, humans to apes back to humans. And every single day they have a new, you know, funky monkey that they come up with. And so I'm going to wait for the scientists to tell me whether the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke the truth or not. No, 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 no. No, I'm having none of that. I'm not interested. You shouldn't be interested either. The Messenger of Allah statement goes above everybody else's. And that is the adab with the Messenger of Allah. And that applies in another area. Another area where when we say the Messenger of Allah said, you say, yeah, but Sheikh said, but Mawlana... The halwa eating Maulana from the village said, my uncle said, my grandpa said, and Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said, if, if, if the Messenger of Allah was standing in front of you and he told you the same thing, would you tell him, Ma'alish, but uh, such and such person said that, or would you obey? He would obey. He said, he said it's the same thing. What, you, what, you, what reaches you after his death, alayhi holds the same authority as what he would have told you in person. 
And so if you would not, in front of the Messenger of Allah, decline his command because of someone else's, therefore now when, it, when you receive it, you shouldn't decline it either. But today, unfortunately, illa man rahim Allah, the opinions of everybody are put forward before the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salam, illa man rahim Allah. Ala kulli hal. Uh, thirdly, following the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in all statements and all actions. وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ You want the mercy of Allah? Allah says, establish the salah, pay the zakah, and obey the messenger. Perhaps you may receive mercy. Perhaps you will be shown mercy. It's dependent and reliant upon obeying the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We said in the hadith in Bukhari uh, from Malik ibn Huwayrith, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَصَلُّوا كَمَا رَأَيْتُمُونِي أُصَلِّي Pray as you have seen me pray. He, uh, he, he commanded us sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to pray in the same manner in which he prayed. And therefore your salah should be like that of the Messenger of Allah. Not according to the Hanafi Madhab, and not according to the Shafi'i Madhab, or the Hanbali Madhab. The Madhab are beautiful, wonderful, they are a good reference, they are a good resource. They are the ones who've, who simplified matters for us, and they categorized them for us, and they helped us attain knowledge. No problem. We are not anti-Madhab. But we are not going to be a Madhabi, blind following a Madhab, even though it contradicts the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Which is what happens for the most part. So you want to follow a, a fiqhi madhab, an asl from the usul, knock yourself out. But don't ever allow that to make you reach a point where you say, yeah, but the madhab says, even though you have a, a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is authentic, that gives you a variant uh, direction. So we have to be very careful in this regard. Also, the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah, the famous long hadith, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the Hajj, لِتَأْخُذُوا مَنَاسِكَكُمْ فَإِنِّي لَا أَدْرِي لَعَلِّي لَا أَحُجُّ بَعْدَ حَجَّةِ هَذِ Take from me your rights of Hajj, perhaps I will not uh, perform Hajj after this Hajj of mine, alayhi wa sallam. And he didn't sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in Hajj, he was instructing them to perform Hajj like he did. In Salah, he instructed us to perform Salah like he did. And therefore, this is a foundation that everything that he did, you do. Now, here's, a, here's a, a benefit for you. The scholars say, therefore, everything that he could have done, yet he did not do, then you shouldn't do also. I repeat, anything that he could have done, the, the occasion arose for that action or statement to take place, yet it didn't take place, the sunnah becomes that you don't do that either. So if the, for example, drawing lines in the masjid, Bismillah. Making lines for the salah. Could the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have done that during his time? Yes. Did he do it? No. What's the sunnah? Don't do it. Making dua after the salah in congregation, which is the most common practice in the Muslim world, except a minority of countries. Or places, or masajid, I would say. Did the Prophet وسلم, ever, ever finish salah, turn around, make dua with the Sahaba, where he would make dua and they would say, Ameen? Did he do it once? Not even a single authentic evidence, as far as I know, not even a fabricated evidence. There's absolutely no evidence for it whatsoever. Could he have done it? Why not? Did he not do it? He didn't. What's the sunnah? Don't do it. See how simple it is? If you follow this methodology and this, this uh, uh, concept, you will never be led astray and you will never abandon the sunnah, nor will you ever add something to the sunnah that is not of it and then attribute it to the sunnah. Fourthly, avoiding what the Prophet ﷺ forbade. And before I elaborate on this, uh, I have a couple of announcements to make. I just remembered. Number one, if you have any questions, please make sure you register on the Kalima website. Register on the Kalima website with your email because they will uh, Kalima will send out an email to you where you can ask your questions. 
Inshallah on the 20th of uh, May, January, February, March, April, May. On the 20th of May, we will have a dedicated Q&A session where your questions, inshallah ta'ala, will be answered during that session. So please make sure you register so that you may receive this uh, email and then you could uh, send the questions. And inshallah, if I have answers to them, then I will entertain those on a dedicated session, which is the last session of the course, dedicated for the Q&A, bi'idhnillahi azza wa Zakumla khair, I just remembered that. Tight. Fourthly, then avoiding what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade. Allahu Akbar. Listen to this. Allah says in Surah An Nisa, Ayah 115, Whoever opposes the messenger. After the guidance have been made clear to him or her, and he follows a path other than that of the believers, then we will allow them to take the path they have chosen, but then we will place them in the hellfire and what a terrible abode. Time out. Two things to highlight. First of all, that if you don't know, you're excused with, for ignorance. If we don't know, we are excused for ignorance. That's why it says, وَمَن يُشَاكِكِ الرَّسُولِ مِن بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَى After the guidance has been made clear to you, then you oppose the messenger. Then another note that we want to add in this ayah is, وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And he follows the path other than that of the believers. Who were the believers when this ayah was revealed? Answer me. Answer me even though I cannot hear you. Answer me, answer me. Who were the believers when this ayah was revealed? The Sahaba. If you follow a path other than the Sahaba, then you have a problem. Because the ayah, linguistically, would have been complete if Allah said, وَمَن يُشَاكِكِ الرَّسُولُ مَنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيْنَا الْهُدَى نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُصْلِهِ جَهَنَّمْ The addition of وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ is for a reason. Because Allah Azza wa Jal is showing us which type of Islam you must follow. Because Allah already all knew. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us that this ummah will divide into 73 sects, 73 sects, 73 denominations and, and divisions. And from each, we know that there's even more and more. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that upon you is my way and the way of the right, rightly guided khulafa. And then when he was asked about that one, one, uh, one group that would be saved, he said, whoever is upon what I am today and my companions. We have very clear-cut instructions about how to save yourself, brothers and sisters. Be careful of so many verses of Islam. If you just listen, if you just listen to some of the stuff on YouTube by various you know, sources, you get baffled. Like, what, what's going on? Like, how much, how much change do people make to, to make Islam agreeable to the non-Muslims, knowing that it's going to be a mission impossible. They're not going to like it until you become a, you know, a Jew or a Christian. Let's just keep it real. And we invite them to the deen of Allah with excellent uh, preaching and with good character and you know, with all the good stuff. And, you know, but at the end of the day, Islam has to be the same. It's Allah's revelation. We don't have the right to make any alterations and changes to it. We have to be very careful. So the way of the believers is a key in this ayah. Allah says in the Quran, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَن تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ These are scary, the scariest ayat in the Quran. And honestly, I, يعني, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive me and forgive us all because this is where we all fall short. Let those who oppose the messenger, oppose his command, be careful, beware that they might be afflicted with a fitna or with a severe punishment. Allah al-Musta'an. It's a serious thing. If it's obligatory, then we need to do it. If we fall short, we need to repent to Allah Azza wa Jal and seek forgiveness. And perfection belongs to Allah. Allah also says, وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Whatever the messenger gives you, take it. And whatever he prevents you, whatever he prohibits, then leave it alone. Therefore, the Prophet ﷺ has his own do's and don'ts. There are things that he commanded us to do. We should try our, our level best to fulfill them. And there are things which he forbade that we need to stay away from. Tooth and nail. To the best of our ability. 
an interesting hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa the hadith of Abu Huraira, wherein the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, كل أمتي يدخلون الجنة إلا من أبا All of my ummah will enter Jannah except those who refuse. قالوا ومن يأبى يا رسول الله قالوا يا رسول الله ومن يأبى Different narratives. They said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, who will disobey? Or who will disobey, O oh, Messenger of Allah? The Sahaba were, were, were puzzled. How can everybody enter Jannah except those who refuse? Imagine the Prophet says, enter Jannah. And some say, no, thank you. Not interested. قالوا ومن يأبى يا رسول الله who will, dis, who, will, who will disobey who will refuse قال من أطاعني دخل الجنة whoever obeys me will enter جنة ومن عصاني فقد أبى whosoever disobeys me has refused سبحان الله يعني has refused the invitation of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to enter جنة so people want to be uh, you know following the Quran strictly then which جنة do they want to enter when the Prophet وسلم, is the first one to open the gates of Jannah and the first one to enter Jannah and one who will intercede for the Muslims. They want to disconnect from the Messenger of Allah and make the religion the Quran only. You can't get anywhere. Fifthly, that you put forth and forward the statement of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, over the rest of the world. And this is what we highlighted earlier. And we will just remind. And that is specifically in the area of you have a sunnah, then you have an opinion of someone else, and then you give precedence to that someone else over the Messenger of Allah. Some people do this with scholars, some people do this with scientists, some people do this with some philosophers, some people do it with you know uh, their relatives. Uh, it doesn't matter who, but someone is given precedence over the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and that is the last trait you wanna have if you want to have good manners with the Messenger of Allah. Good manners with the Messenger of Allah is the opposite. Sixthly, مَحَبَّةُ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَكْثَرْ مِنْ مَحَبَّةِ النَّفْسِ وَالْمَالِ وَالْوَالِدَيْنِ وَالنَّاسِ أَجْمَعِينَ That you love the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than you love yourself and your wealth and your parents and the whole of the world, the whole of mankind, the whole dunya, jinn and ins. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith of Bukhari Muslim لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين None of you will believe until I am more beloved to him than his father and his son and the whole of, the whole of mankind. Did you reflect? لا يؤمن أحدكم this obviously negates the perfection of Iman, as the scholars say. Your Iman is not sound. It is not full-fledged. It is not fortified. It is not guaranteed until you love the Messenger of Allah more than your father, your son, and the whole of mankind. What does that mean? That means you don't wind up favoring them over the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa in terms of their opinion versus his, or if they were present, then you favor them over him, alayhi salatu And you all know the hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab, that the Prophet sallallahu said, Ya Umar, uh, Umar said, Oh Master of Allah, you are more beloved to me than everything except myself. And this is from the honesty of Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu. This is how honest they were. This is his... This is what he felt. He loves the Masjid of Allah more than anything, but you, you generally love yourself. And if you are Umar, you better love yourself. Now, Umar is not a lightweight. I mean, one of us may not love himself because we have a million problems, but Umar ibn al-Khattab, Allahu Akbar. The Prophet ﷺ said, La. Yani, your iman is not complete. وَالَّذِي نَفْسِ بِيَدِ حَتَّى أكون, أَكُونَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ نَفْسِكَ Your iman will not be complete until I am more beloved to you than yourself. Umar processed the statement and with the ultimate sincerity that we know from him, he said, Wallahi, and he's Wallahi, you are not more beloved to me than myself. The Prophet ﷺ said, Now, meaning now your iman is complete, Ya Umar. Now your iman is complete. And Umar automatically deciphered the statement and realized, wait a second. I mean, how can I love myself more than the Messenger of Allah? This is the Messenger of Allah whom Allah Azza wa Jal selected. 
for the for for our salvation. How much sacrifice did the Prophet sallallahu make for this ummah? Do you understand what he had to go through, and how he was fought against, and how he was criminalized, and how he was demonized? He was called a magician. He was called a soothsayer. He was called a poet. He was driven out of his home, had to migrate. What did he have to go through for this ummah? For us to receive a sunnah today, it's beyond what words can say. فَجَزَاهُ اللَّهُ عَنَّا خَيْرَ الْجَزَاءُ وَصَلَّ عَلَيْهِ تَسْلِيمًا وَصَلَاةً وَتَسْلِيمًا كَثِيرًا عَلَيْهِ صَلَاةُ السَّلَامُ How are you not going to love him? Someone who made so, more sacrifice than what your parents sacrificed for you. The sacrifice of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم towards each individual of us is greater than the sacrifice our parents made. Because the sacrifice that our parents made are actually a byproduct of his sacrifice. If they care for, the, for your dunya, for your worldly life, then definitely they're not at par. If they were also keen and they sacrificed for your religion, they only did this because the Messenger of Allah told them to do so. So you still owe it back to him. You still owe it back to him at the end of the day. Also, the seventh trait of having manners with the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam is At-Taslim li-hukmin Nabiyyi sallallahu alayhi wasalam Allah says in the Quran فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّيَمُوكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَدَيْتَ وَيُسَلِّمُ تَسْلِيمًا Nay, by your Lord, they shall not believe until they refer to you as a judge, until they make you a judge regarding everything that they differ about, everything that they argue about. شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ Any type of argumentation and discourse that happens between them, discord that happens between them. Then after they refer to you, they do not find within themselves any, any hardship, any unease. There's zero unease with the decision. تَسْلِيمًا Then they submit in full submission. Look at all the levels that you have to fulfill to have truly attained the belief in Allah Azza wa Jal and in Islam. You have to refer to the sunnah first. Then you should have nothing in your heart when the decision is given to you, when the fatwa is given to you. And then you submit in full submission. Where are we from that, my brothers and sisters? Today, as a sister, you know, Bismillah. She uh, gets, uh, you know, she has a problem with her husband. Uh, and, you know, there's divorce involved. She will go to the uh, Western courts, uh, you know, or some, some foreign courts. Because she knows that she will get more, more dunya. From with these laws that Allah Azza wa Jal didn't reveal. So she knows that, for example, Islam gave the man this right, or he gave her that right, but those rights to her are not as pleasant as what the uh, alternative law will offer. So she will willingly turn around and go to those laws because she's just looking for the worldly matter. And I'm not trying to pick on the sisters. The brother will do the same thing in a million other things as well. The brother will do the same thing in a million other that he will he, if he has to make a decision he will give precedence to the culture over the religion of Allah. The culture dictates what is okay, what is not okay. How many how many of the Muslims today have it so that the uh, brother-in-law lives at the same home uh, as the the brother and his wife and then the husband goes to work and I've heard this from so many people and then the wife and the brother-in-law remain by themselves. They say, Akhi, he's like my brother. Culture this, culture that. Ya Shaykh, Ya Shaykh, are you out of your mind? The Prophet وسلم, said, Alhamu maut, the brother in law is death. Yani the level of danger associated with that in particular is like the highest, it's like death. And yet, Muslims all over the world, they live in a house where everybody mixes. Culture dictates that the husband lives with his wife. And he lives with his brother and he lives with his father and mother and the whole family, joint joint family. The woman has to wear hijab at home or she doesn't wear hijab so she's exposed instead of then mahram. And there's no privacy for them. All of these are compromises of the sunnah of the Prophet And people choose culture because it's more practical, more convenient, peer pressure, cultural pressure, so on and so forth. And then the, the sunnah is dismissed. And when you tell him, Ya Akhi, the... the you, the Prophet ﷺ said, Alhamu maut. Does he do, does he refer to the sunnah? Does he have the la haraj? 
مما قضيت and does he do full submission or does he say آه معليش معليش الله غفور رحيم that's the reality of the matter that the people will make that selection and that is lack of manners with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the examples are ample and many the examples are ample are many and I know you can relate to so many in your life in your culture and your family but we have to be the pioneers who bring forth the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the best of our ability not denying our shortcomings and falling short and not living up to it all the time no doubt wallahi we're all guilty i'm guilty you're guilty i'm sure everybody's guilty in his own way nevertheless principle wise that is what we are expected and supposed to do we have to put forth the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and make it the reference for the ummah because that's how you have a truly muslim household and that will lead me to the last aspect of our discussion and probably one of the most dangerous and critical ones and that is mockery of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ya Akhwan and Akhawat you have to be very very careful a lot of people take this matter extremely lightly and they they make fun of uh, for example I uh, among some of my colleagues at work I, I had on my uh, fitness page a talk that I gave with a fellow brother uh, and the brother, mashallah tabarakallah, has a, a bushy beard and people always you know, wondering the beard the beard, يعني, some beards don't grow just so you know some beards remain in the same length for 20-25 years or they barely grow just like not all hair is meant to grow forever Allah made certain hair grow a lot and certain hair reach a limit. Otherwise, your arm hair, if, if hair continue to grow, then by the time you're 40, 50 years old, you're a man, your, your arm hair should be this big. And your armpit hair should be tied around your ankles. It doesn't grow. So those who have this obsession with the beard, grew bushy, small, you put some things, you fix it. It, it looks different. Let the people live with their beards. But anyways, that brother had a bushy beard, mashallah, tabarakallah, it's just the way Allah made him, the way Allah created him. So this person in, in joking, when he saw the poster of me standing there with my tiny little beard that has been like this for years, and that brother's big beard, he said, mashallah, irhabi, a real irhabi, a real terrorist, about, my, about the brother. I said, yani, ya akhi, this is the people don't even think twice about this. Yani the people that are not observant of the sunnah, they don't even think twice. They think, I'm just joking. If you were to discuss this with them further, the general saying, Yeah, I know, man, of course he's not a terrorist, and I don't mean it. I'm saying this, but this is you just said that someone with a big beard, long beard, necessitates uh, some radicalism and terrorism. Therefore, you just said that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, who had a big beard is a terrorist. Are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? SubhanAllah. Or the people that say the sister who's dressed up from top to bottom looks like a, a bag of trash or something of the sort and they make fun of the dress code of the woman that want to cover herself like the Sahabiyat cover themselves. This is mockery of the Sunnah and mockery of the Sunnah is like right there with Kufr. Your pants are too high, your thobe is too short. You know, you always in the masajid. Do you, do you have Mr. Haram police? Always enjoying the good, forbidding the evil. Why don't you calm down and take it easy? They make fun of people that enjoy the good, forbid the evil. Ya Sheikh, be careful, be very careful. This happened at the time of the Sahaba. They said we haven't seen any, anyone like our Quran reciters, the Munafikun back then. Akbar butunan with bigger bellies. Then the, the, that reached the Messenger of Allah. And he confronted them. And Allah says in the Quran, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ لَيَقُولُونَ إِنَّ مَا كُنَّا نَخُوضُ وَنَلْعَبُ If you ask them, they say, oh, we were just playing around, we're just having fun, it's just, just idle talk. قُلْ أَبِ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِهِ وَرَسُولِهِ كُنْتُمْ تَسْتَهْزِئُونَ Say, is it regarding Allah and His signs and His ayat and His messenger that you are mocking and making fun? لَا تَعْتَذِرُوا Don't apologize. قَدْ كَفَرْتُمْ بَعْدَ إِمَانِكُمْ You have disbelieved after your iman. Do you know how serious that is? 
Do you realize how serious that is? It's an act of disbelief to mock the religion. And so brothers and sisters on Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat, those people that are constantly making memes of religious matters, the people that want to put the religion in the window of entertainment, I tell you, please, please, please be very careful and leave that alone. Leave it alone. It's a thin line. It's a fine, thin, fine line between your iman and your disbelief. The matters of the religion are never to be joked about. Before you stand in Salah, it is not the time to joke. Be while reading the Quran, it's not the time to joke. When you want to make a joke, it, the religion should not be your subject. The religion should not be your subject. I've seen calamities on social media of people trying to be funny. But they want to use the religion as means of entertainment. You have to be very, very careful. Because it falls onto that very delicate matter of mocking the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ should be venerated. If we're unable because of our shortcoming, then we just take a, a, a side, uh, you know, we side sideline and we zip it. That's it. If we're falling short, raise your hand, say May Allah forgive me. I'm, I'm, I'm unable to live up to it. But at least be quiet. Don't oppose it. Don't argue with it. Don't fight against it. Don't mock it because you cannot do it. That's, that's all that dares to it. Don't you dare say, Wallah, because, because you're unable to fulfill it, then try to attack it to justify it yourself. That's the atheist mentality. Why do you think the atheists want to believe that there's no God? Because they have a conscience that makes them feel guilty. That they're living life like you know cattle and how do they get away with that the only way they will feel not they will feel less guilty or no guilt is by saying that there's no accountability that way they can do whatever they want and not feel guilty about it that's the mentality of the atheist that's why they're adamant on saying there is no god there is no day of judgment there's nothing after death even though they've never been to death and come back for them, for them to know that there's nothing after death but they will stand in your face and and tell you there's nothing after you die khalas it's over Say, bring forth your evidence if you're truthful. They don't have any evidence. It's mere assumptions. But they go to this level. And I know Muslims who have left the religion because of that. They don't want to feel guilty. So it's, it's a thought process that you have to be very careful with. When we're unable to fulfill the sunnah, say, Allah musta'an, make dua, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, urtuf bi, wajalni min atba' sunnah al-Nabi alayhi salam. Don't get philosophical about it. Allah yard alayk. Don't become uh, yani Einstein when it comes to it. Yeah, but brother, let me tell you because my uncle told my aunt that if the car goes next to the bus stop, then you're going to find a bicycle landing on your head. Yeah, Sheikh, what are you saying, man? Just like you didn't understand what I'm saying, we don't understand what you're saying. Just a bunch of brrrr. Nobody's trying to hear you. Khalas, khalas. You cannot live up to the sunnah say, I'm falling short, I'm going to work on myself. Allah will show mercy to you. Allah loves the slave who is humble, who knows his limitations. But those who want to oppose the Messenger of Allah, they're just hanging themselves, man. And we cannot afford to be hung, man. Wallah al-musta'an. Ala kulli hal, that concludes this session about the etiquettes with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa And insha'Allah ta'ala, I look forward to having you with us in the next episode. Bi'idhillahi jalla jalalahu wa taqaddasat asma'u. And inshallah, we will be discussing an interesting topic and something that has been on my mind. That is the etiquettes of dealing with parents and children. I said uh, children with parents and parents with children. Uh, we've discussed it briefly in the introduction, but we will dig deeper inshallah in the next session. So don't forget to register on Kalima to be able to send you questions so that we can address them on the 20th of May in a dedicated Q&A session. Jazakumullahu khairan for your attentive listening.